Well, it is 9 a.m., so hello, hello. Hey. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us on this terrific Tuesday. Um, we are excited that you are here. Um, it's a little gloomy here up in Windsor, so I feel like it's a great day to cozy up with a great webinar. So, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, and I am Sierra Pratt. I am today's uh, moderator. I'm the ma a marketing manager at Star Staffing. I'm very excited to learn more about managing finances with Brandon, who'll be our guest speaker today, and hopefully you can see him um, right now. Uh, before we dive into our topic, I want to share with you about the next webinar coming hey, up on June 2nd. Uh, mark your calendar. Elena Noel will be talking about inspiring accountability and remote workers. She will be sharing details on an easy to learn format for accountability conversations that don't trigger employee defensiveness, that empowers leaders to comfortably address performance gaps and offers a better experience in improving results for all involved. You will walk away with resources and strategies that will get results while keeping employees engaged. And registration is now live. You can check out starhr.com slash webinars for details and uh, the link to register. All right, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Brandon, who is today's speaker. Brandon Trammell is the founder of Purpose Financial and Insurance Services based out of Novato. He is focused on helping business owners and professionals create asset resiliency by aligning values with goals for accumulation and asset protection. His expertise includes 401k and similar employer-based plans, IRAs, business succession, insurance planning, tax diversification strategies, and more. Brandon is a member of the Rotary Club of Petaluma, 40 Under 40 Award recipient by the North Bay Business Journal, and all around great human. So welcome, Brandon, um, and I'll have you share a little bit more about your business and your background, um, and let's see if I can give you control here. Um, you should be able to take on over. All right, did you get it? Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. I, uh, I am, just honored to be here with you guys today. Um, you know, I'm, uh, and please do forgive me uh, as I am trying to <laughs> navigate some some technical uh, experience here. I have I've never taken control of somebody else's screen share, um, and I'm not sure exactly how to do that. So so bear with me on that. Um, I see your screen, Sierra, which is um, the over the total presentation. Okay, so um, if you go up to the If slides. you want to, I'm not sure how to advance. Okay, can you advance Sorry? now? Can you advance now? There you go. I think that was you. Oh, excellent. So let's okay. see if my, hey, look at that. There you go, you're all oh. set. <laughs> So I'll let you go ahead and take over. Um, will you it. kind of get your feelers there out there? I just wanted All to right. remind everybody too that if you have awesome. questions, go ahead and jump in with your questions. Um, we do have some that came in prior, so we'll get to those as well. But if you have them, go ahead and send them in as we go. And then when we wrap up the presentation, we'll go ahead and get to as many as we can. Um, and if there are some that come in during, Brandon will go ahead and try to answer those as well, I believe. So um, yeah, go ahead and, and jump those questions in as they come out. Okay. Awesome, will do. Um, trying to, I wonder if I just use my arrows, if that will work. Well, uh, anyway, everybody, thank you so much for, for taking time to, to be on the, the call today. I really do, I'm, I'm honored by the opportunity to, to share my experience um, with other people and, and especially you know, in a time like the one that we're in now, um, something that none of us have really ever experienced. It's, it's just an honor to be with you guys. So a little about me, um, and just to make sure, are you, are, Sierra, are you guys seeing the, uh, the slide of me and my family? Yes. Okay. Yep, you're okay. Good. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I, I put my sort of qualifications here in this order because I think, um, you know, it's really, it's what's important. I'm, I put a husband first uh, because, you know, I want to stay married and anybody who is married uh, <laughs> will attest to the fact that you put your, put the needs of your family and your wife first, you'll, you'll, you'll lead a 
long and happy marriage. Um, you know, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a father of two daughters, one seven and, and one almost four. Um, that's a beautiful experience and very challenging. I am a friend and, uh, you know, I like to think of myself as a, a financial guide. Um, you know, this is really uh, the most important factor of my responsibilities in the financial services industry. And I've, I've been in financial services about 15 years, started my career in, in banking and uh, had the opportunity, you know, to, uh, to stick around. And I made my way into insurance and investments a little over six years ago. And uh, a couple of years back, I started my firm, which is Purpose Financial and Insurance Services, um, out of a, a really strong desire to just offer a different kind of experience in financial services, one that is human-centered, values-driven, um, and, and really digs in on uh, helping us all to get a positive and beneficial mindset around our money, how we deal with it, how we spend it, how we save it. Um, and really the, the main principle, the main value or values that I have founded this firm on are, are really, uh, you know, people first and education, putting the client and the people um, that I work with and for first um, above generating revenue and profit for myself. Now, this is obviously a very, uh, a very necessary thing, have to generate profits to be able to stay in business. But um, for me, people have always come first. Um, you know, we are in a time right now that is um, challenging to say the least. You know, I'm a, I'm a father, uh, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher dad uh, on a daily basis. And, you know, this is, um, it's a very challenging time for all of us. We're seeing a lot of uh, real hard stuff out there that people are experiencing loss. And um, all of us in our business are, are experiencing these challenges uh, somewhat the same, but also distinctly differently. And, you know, it's important for us to, to touch on that. Um, you know, what I have done in my business is really um, stepped away from, you know, how can I generate revenue to how can I serve? Um, and, and really understanding that people need guidance in navigating these really unprecedented times, um, especially on the financial side of things, because the last thing we want is, you know, uh, sheltering in place and then, you know, our, our financial circumstances uh, just doubling up on us and and really not being all that beneficial. So, you know, being there for my clients and, and in ways like this for people who are not my clients, but really just to support community and um, how do we keep our mind focused on our financial circumstances um, so that we can come out the other side of this uh, in, in good shape. And so, you know, helping my clients and, and really my general community in navigating the financial side of this pandemic, as well as, you know, the changes that are coming in investment industry and insurance industry, uh, because really it's, it's gotta be a we effort. Together is the only way forward here. So uh, I'm just honored to be a part of this uh, with you guys here today. Now, I'm gonna touch on a couple of things today that I think are, are really, really important for us to consider when we're looking at our, our saving strategies uh, and really the health of our money. And so I'm gonna take you guys all through a, a, a piece of my process that I take my clients through at a deeper level, uh, something called the financial EKG. And you know, uh, we all know what an EKG is, right? When we go to the doctor, that EKG, checks the health of our heart, right? Uh, well, this process is, is designed to um, help us check the health of our money. And, and also the name is a little bit of a play on words. It was a process actually uh, originally developed for a group of doctors. And so you know, to keep it uh, congruent with, with their world, uh, we call it the financial EKG. Now, what this process is really all about and, and what you're gonna see here uh, as I navigate you guys through these slides um, is firstly, there, there are two boxes and one of them is the accumulation phase, the other is the conservation phase because these are the two distinct phases, whether we're business owners or employees, whatever, um, 
you know, professional circumstance we find ourselves in, these are the two phases of our savings life, if you will, or our financial life. One is the accumulation phase and the other conservation phase. Um, and you know, that, that's life, right? The accumulation phase starts when we enter the workforce um, and it ends when we exit the workforce. Uh, the conservation phase begins when we exit the workforce and well, it ends when we exit the world. Uh, and now, you know, the, you'll see that the accumulation phase here as we go through a line that divides the two. And that's because there are really two ways uh, to make money, right? There's us at work, people at work and uh, money at work. So when we, uh, when we're at work, then we have the ability to, uh, you know, make money and generate revenue. But as we go along, we're saving as well. Now, this line sort of represents the, uh, the life of us during our workforce years, right, when we're accumulating. And so when we think about it, right, uh, when we're starting, it's all us at work, right? And what we would like to say is that about halfway through our working career, right, that the money that we have saved or invested would be able to provide half of the income um, that we would want in retirement. Now, I'll say this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty seldom that we actually find ourselves, uh, that I find most people in this circumstance and situation. Um, it usually looks a little more like this, right? We save and we're not really sure we may or may not work with a financial advisor. And so we trudge along, we save, even though we're not sure the best way or the best place. Uh, until we come to work with a professional or we come to you know, hear the information that we're hearing like on today's call, right? And then we sort of have that wake up moment like, oh wow, I really need to get to work. <laughs> uh, and so then we've got you know, a, a bit of a steeper climb um, than we might like, right? Uh, especially in the United States, right? Uh, in, especially in California, I'll say, uh, where we find ourselves in, um, sort of a, a consumer culture, right? Uh, an immediate gratification sort of culture. Um, you know, we, we tend to not be able to save as much as we'd like and the cost of living is very high. So, you know, then we come and we say, wow, okay, we gotta get to work, right? Um, and so, you know, if you're gonna retire at that normal, at the normal age or at the age that we had set forth, um, then we've got a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a steep climb, right? So. Now, and also, uh, you know, this is why I think we see people working longer and longer, right? Because uh, either you save at a higher rate than you're able to, or you sort of put that uh, retirement age out a little bit. And that's, you know, I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, 75 is full retirement age by the time, you know, uh, my generation comes to actually retire. So, all right, so let's Let's look at a for example here, right? Let's let's take a 40 year old. Uh, and so, you know, when does that 40 year old want to retire? I think uh, a lot of times when I do this, in, I've done this in person uh, it, to groups, you know, I get 41, right? <laughs> I, I know this 40 year old would like to retire at 41, uh, but let's let's get realistic about it. And, and we'll say that the desired retirement age is 65. So that gives this 40 year old 25 years to uh, achieve, whoa, Whoa, <laughs> I think we went a little too far. Um, lost control of my slides. The 40-year-old uh, has 25 years to retire. And uh, let's see if I can get back to my place on the illustrations. Um, so, and let's assume that this 40-year-old uh, is making $80,000 of income right now and wants to maintain that sort of that, that same level of, of income when they retire. Now I'll, I'll touch on the point that, um, you know, today's dollars of 80,000 in income um, when we retire may or may not be enough. It sort of depends on your perspective. Um, you know, you might want to spend your retirement years doing all the things that you didn't have time to do when you were working, uh, you know, seven Saturdays a week is an expensive lifestyle. So, you know, uh, maybe some people want more income than they're making right now when they retire. And, and some people feel, well, you know, I won't have uh, all the things that I need to purchase 
for work purposes, like, you know, suits and ties or dress clothes or dress shoes, or, uh, you know, I won't be contributing to my 401k anymore. Um, I won't have all the, you know, the, the payroll taxes, right, as a business owner. Uh, we'll have income taxes, right, especially depending on, on how we save, uh, but um, we won't have the payroll taxes anymore, right? So really the, the level of income that you have in retirement um, is, is specific to you and the lifestyle that you want to lead. But in a general sense, and, and I'll say just for, for today's purposes and for the illustration purposes, because um, I built it this way, um, we'll use uh, $60,000 as the level of retirement income that this uh, person, this 40-year-old person wants in retirement. Um, now, let's say an anticipated rate of return of 8%, right, while we're accumulating that money. Now, I know uh, I'll, I'll take a beat to acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, 8% when we're talking about uh, kind of this crazy volatility and the downturn that we saw, you know, who knows what our rate of return will be. It's very unknown, but we'll just say, uh, you know, 8%. And, and actually, when we look at it, if I go back to 2009, uh, until actually at the bottom of the dip that we most recently saw, right, the market down uh, 40%, the S&P down 40%. If I look at the rate of return from, you know, 2009 at the bottom till the bottom of what we saw uh, about, you know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it's actually uh, an increase of 7.25%, of, uh, just under 7.25%. So with that in mind, right, even through all the dips, we still see um, some pretty consistent returns over time. So we'll go with 8% just for the purposes of, of today's call. Um, and then in retirement, right, we get a little more conservative, don't we? So um, we'll likely be accepting of a little bit of a lower return. And so we'll just say you know, 5% for uh, post-retirement rate of return, and, and we'll just use those assumptions, right? Um, now, that 5% sort of helps us to determine how big the bag of money needs to be. And I, you know, it was a bit of a spoiler alert if anybody was, was watching the slides earlier, but how big does that bag of money need to be um, for us to produce that $60,000 of income every year? Um, and spoiler alert, right, 1.2 million. So how do I get to that figure? Uh, if I divide uh, 1.2 million by 0 0.05 or 5%, uh, or I'm sorry, if I divide the 60,000, right, the income that I want by 5%, uh, 0 0.05, it produces that number of 1.2 million. And in the reverse, that means that that 5% rate of return on a bag of money of $1.2 million will produce $60,000 of income for me every year. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people are probably crunching numbers in their head right now like what is my number and and you know this uh, let me just say that this is a, a sort of a, a general for example right and and this is a process that i take my clients through to really determine what their number is and and that target that we need to shoot for how much we need to save right so um so i i will say that for for the purposes of today's conversation i'm going to sort of set inflation aside because it, it muddies the water big time and, and it is an important factor, but it, it's, it's tough to account for. Here's what I'll say, we'll, we'll, we'll set that aside, right? Uh, as far as today's illustrations, but um, you know, people are probably also asking themselves, well, like $60,000, I don't need that without ever dipping into the bag over my lifetime, right? I, I can use some of that money that I've accumulated. I don't need to just live on the interest. And, uh, and that's, that's true, right? You don't need 60 grand without ever touching your principal, right? Um, but again, you know, that's where the inflation piece comes in and we can't adjust for it along the way anymore. Um, so once we've accumulated that bag of money, there's really nothing more you can do to adjust, right? You have to live with inflation at that point. So I'll, I'll speak to something that, uh, and some of you may, or may have heard of, um, or maybe not, um, but there's something in my world that's called the rule of 72. Now this, this works for us to kind of as a, as a crude calculation, right? For, um, how long does it take my money to double at a, a certain rate of return? Right? So 
think about it this way. If, <clears throat> if I was getting a 4% rate of return, right, then how long would it take for my money to double? So if I divide 72 by four, it produces uh, the number 18, right? So that, what does that mean? That means it would, at a 4% rate of return, it would take 18 years for my money to double, okay? Um, and it works exactly the opposite for inflation, right? So if we were experiencing 4% inflation, which is a, a bit above where we've experienced, you know, the rate of inflation that we've experienced over the past few years, uh, and I'll, I'll even say a uh, decade or two, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll just use that number, for example, because it, it well, it's what I've built into the example again. Um, so, so with that, in 18 years then, uh, 18 years into retirement, my, if, if we're experiencing that 4% rate of inflation, then 18 years in, my 60,000 of income actually only buys $30,000 worth of goods and services, right? And then if I went another 18 in, well then, you know, I'm experiencing actually $15,000 worth of purchasing power, which as we all know, is, is just absolutely not enough, right? Now, a whole bunch of assumptions in here, I understand 4% rate of inflation over, over time and all that, but uh, again, hypothetical so that we can understand conceptually, how do we navigate this sort of stuff? So what does that mean? That means that 18 years into retirement, if I wanna keep that same level of purchasing power that you know 18 years before 60,000 was giving me, then that means I need to be drawing 120,000 of income out of that bag, right? And then, in another 18 years, uh, given these assumptions, I would need to have, oh, I would need to have uh, $240,000 of income, right? So we can see that, you know, over the course of a 30, 30 plus year retirement, which is what a lot of people may very well experience, uh, you know, we need to be able to keep pace of it with inflation, right? Um, and, and that's how we do that by, uh, digging into that principle, right? So if it's only producing 60 grand, right, then we can see how we're going to have to start dipping in and then the bag produces less because there's less money in there, even if it's the same rate of return. So we can see how that downward, that downward uh, spiral on our money can really have a profound effect. Now, a lot of things that are included for, you know, our cost of living when we're in retirement, right, that we didn't have when we were working and uh, Healthcare, right, is one of those, especially now. Um, so, you know, what what we I'll say this: like perfect planning would be I draw my last dollar with my last breath, right? Uh, or even better yet, right, the the check to the mortuary bounces. Um, but you know, in, in all kidding aside, right, the um, the erosionary power of inflation is something that you know we want to take into account and can't really be super uh, accurate. I guess we could plug a number into a model, right? But the only thing we know is we're wrong. We just don't know how wrong, right? So uh, it's one of those age old questions, uh, but, you know, how do we adjust for it? But here's a method, right? Here's a method that can help us do that. Um, so 1.2 million, 25 years, this 25 year old, uh, or this 40 year old with 25 years, assuming that they had saved nothing up until that point, would have to contribute 1300 a month, 1367 a month, uh, earning that 8% rate of return over 25 years to get out to that bag of money of, of 1.2 million. Um, you know, that's doable for some, um, not doable for others. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a given an $80,000, you know, um, annual income, that $1,300 uh, a month, represents, you know, well, a little over 10%. I mean, it's about, you know, it's almost 15% rate of savings, right? Um, so not out of line with that sort of old adage of, of you know, saving a dime for every dollar you earn. Um, now, if we uh, had five more years, let's say got on the ball uh, and actually started saving at 35 versus 40, then, you know, it's a, a little over $400 less per month. Um, it's actually almost $500 less per month that would need to be saved. And, you know, if we start looking out, well, you know, I five last years, right? I didn't start until 45. Well, that climb gets a little steeper. 
you know, now I, I'll say this, right? The, again, general numbers, right? This is not uh, necessarily your numbers, um, but if, you know, if you're interested in understanding what your numbers could be and going through this process, you know, we can always um, talk after. Well, my contact information is gonna be available for you guys at the end of this. And um, you can always request that from Sierra and the, and the folks over at, at STAR. So um, this is a, a pivotal piece of understanding, right? We have to understand where we're headed before we can really devise a strategy to get there. So this is one of the, um, one of the processes that I take my clients through and I, and I hope that's valuable if you have questions on this information guys type it into the box because um, you know I, I can't address them all necessarily uh, right now but I you know what your questions are and, and we can address them at the end but put them in the chat box if uh, if you wish to, to ask a question and you know your your brain is like mine and often lets you forget things that are that are needing to be remembered. So um, anyway I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from this piece and I'm gonna share with you guys uh, Sort of as, as an extension of this, um, you know, we'll look at the, the, because one of the number one questions I get is, Brandon, where should I be saving? In my 401k, in my traditional IRA, or in my Roth and <coughs> Roth 401k? Uh, those are, that's, that's one of the number one questions, especially that I get from, you know, the 40 and under crowd. Um, so I'm going to walk you guys through something that I call Robert and Roberta. And this is just a, a sort of a side by side of, of deductible or pre tax savings versus non-deductible or after-tax savings. So the traditional Roth versus the Roth, or the traditional IRA versus the Roth IRA, okay? So um, as we go through, we're gonna look at, you know, these two here, uh, these two culprits, if you will, um, that are saving Robert on a tax deductible, he's doing it in his 401k, and Roberta, who is doing it in her non-deductible or her Roth IRA, uh, and we're going to look at how this breaks down for the two of them. Now they're both contributing four grand every year, okay, out of their income. Now Robert uh, is saving in the pre-tax again, right? So he's paying zero tax on the money that's going into that account. But let's assume a 25% tax rate just makes my numbers easier. And again, you know, but kind of what I built into the illustration. So we'll go with that. Uh, Robert pays zero in taxes. Okay, um, Roberta has the 25%. So Robert's uh, account balance day one, no growth, four grand, right? Roberta pays $1,000 in taxes because she's got 25%. So her account balance on day one with no growth is 3,000. So Robert's ahead at this point, right? It looks like odds are in his favor. Now, if he went and he accessed it on day two, he would have to pay taxes, 25%, right? Same that Roberta paid. And that would leave him with a net balance on day two of $3,000. Now we're gonna even the playing field, right? Because Roberta pays zero in taxes and they have the same net balance. This is not high level math. We're, we're following along, I think here. Now, if we look at their, it, go through everything, all things considered, right? They end up with same rate of return over time, same contribution rates. They go through and we'll assume uh, that Robert has $4,000 or four hundred thousand uh, dollars is his balance, right? And Roberta three hundred thousand. Now, if they liquidated at retirement, uh, he would pay taxes on that full four hundred thousand dollars, right? Twenty five percent, assuming that is still the tax rate. So his balance uh, at that point would be a net of three hundred thousand. Um, Roberta pays zero in taxes, twenty five percent. She's already paid it up front, three hundred thousand. We have an equal playing field again. Now. I, I will absolutely and obviously acknowledge the fact that it is a bad idea to liquidate your retirement accounts at retirement and take a full distribution and pay full taxes on that balance. Not, a, not necessarily the best idea, right? Uh, this is not tax advice uh, or financial distribution advice. Um, this is a hypothetical, right, for us to, to just understand things. So um, now, what happens uh, if a more traditional scenario actually unfolds and we start taking income from those accounts, right? This is how we tend to distribute our retirement accounts once we hit that point of needing it for our, our annual income. Let's assume an annual withdrawal uh, of, um, see now, um, an annual withdrawal, right? Uh, 
of, of 40,000. 10% is a really high uh, distribution rate. Let me just say uh, that that's probably higher than anyone would advise given you know, wanting longevity of our money. And, and on average, most, uh, most experts would agree that you don't wanna outlive your money. A 3% uh, distribution rate from your accounts is, is uh, a real good way to do the best you can to ensure you don't outlive your money, right? Uh, but that's a, a conversation for another day. Um, now, assuming that 10% consistent 10% rate of rate of withdrawal for Roberta, she's going to take 30,000. Robert's going to take 40,000. Now, here is the great equalizer: taxes. <laughs> right? Uh, unfortunately, I think for too long uh, a piece that was not taken into account um, or not factored in enough. Right? The power and and uh, the the power of taxes is immense. So. If we assume the 25% uh, tax rate, right, and we'll stay consistent just for these purposes, uh, that would be $10,000 of taxes paid by Robert. Uh, so that gives his net retirement cash flow of $30,000 annually. Now, Roberta pays zero in taxes, right, because hers is all in her Roth IRA, which is not subject to income taxes. Now, her net retirement cash flow is 30,000 as well. So we're equalized, okay? This, there's no wonder here. Um, this is sort of a, a very level playing field. Now, what happens if tax rates change? Because I, I mean, you and I, I think all of us here know that taxes um, don't always stay the same. We've already experienced some changes right through the, the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, right? That we saw recently and we will certainly see some changes to income tax rates and structures as we go forward, especially after COVID-19. What is that, what is that going to look like? Um, we don't know, right? We, we just don't know. I'll, I'll say this. Um, it's likely to be higher than it is today. And I'm going to touch on that in a moment where my perspective on that comes from, but to stay here with this, let's assume um, what happens if taxes go down, right? Robert deferred at 25%. Uh, income tax rates, and he's drawing it out at 15%. So he actually is a winner in that scenario if taxes go down, where he gets to keep 34,000 of, of annual income versus Roberta still at the 30,000 because she paid taxes before at 25%. She loses in that scenario. What happens if taxes go up, right? Which is a much more likely scenario than down. Not a whole lot of downward mobility for our taxes, our income taxes at this point. Um, again, touch on that in a moment. But Robert then pays fourteen thousand in taxes, where he gets his annual, his net annual is twenty six grand. Roberta gets thirty. She wins. If they stay the same, well, then it's the same, right? Um, you know, guys, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know where tax rates are going, uh, but here in, in this graphic is, is probably a little tough to read depending on what kind of device you're, uh, you know, you're engaging with this information on. If it's a, you know, an iPad or an iPhone, it uh, might be a little tough to read, but here's, here's the high level of what this graphic is really all about. It's showing you in orange the highest income tax bracket and in blue, the lowest income tax bracket from the very beginning of our current tax system and structure back into the, the early 1930s, okay? So that orange shows you at in 1933, the very, very first bar graph, the highest bracket was above 60%. Now, if you go into wartime, right? World War II, um, you're looking at the highest tax bracket above 90% at its highest and the lowest bracket above 20% at its highest. Now we're thinking about in those times, right? Um, early in our, in, our, uh, in our country's sort of uh, economy, right? That the government that was in place saw fit to, instead of going into debt to pay for things, to tax people, right? Sort of the way the structure is intended to work, but um, those things are being paid for with taxes, war, all the materials and things we're paying, paid for by us, by our taxes as citizens. Um, and rightly so. Now, 
we've seen the tax system change so many times over the course of time. There are a bunch of different brackets there, but if we come down to the lowest point, uh, well, the second or third lowest point in our history of income tax rates over at the far right, which ends at 2018, um, there are literally only two periods in the history of our country where taxes have been, sorry, three periods in the history of our country where tax income tax rates have actually been lower than they are right now, right? So what does that tell you, right? We have wars, we have pandemics, we have all kinds of social structures that haven't been paid for. And so where are tax rates gonna go? You know, again, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm no Swami, and I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you if we wanna pay for the things that need paying for, government gets their money from us. So most likely our tax rates are going to increase. That's my humble professional opinion. Um, so I'll, I'll digress from that a little bit. Um, and I'll just, uh, kind of dig in on the cash flow comparison a little bit of these two, um, because I think it's, you know, it's poignant and the slides look a little bit off, but, uh, bear with us on that technology. Uh, you know, let's say Robert's salary, a hundred thousand, we're going to stick with Robert and Roberta on this 4,000, uh, his contribution, his taxable income is then 96,000, right? So the hypothetical tax that he would pay, if we're, cons we're assuming that, again, that 25% tax rate, $24,000, right? So his net spendable income in that scenario is gonna be 72 grand. Now, uh, if we go down through, through Roberta, um, and I'm just gonna kind of skip down to the bottom so I can stop pressing buttons while I talk. <laughs> um, uh, shows us that hypothetical tax that she pays on her $100,000 of income, 25 grand, after tax income is 75,000 uh, with her Roth contribution. Then if, if we go to that same rate of return, right, uh, or that same tax rate, her Roth contribution is three grand. They have the same net spendable income, right? Um, but again, when we start looking at tax rates uh, in the future, we just don't know what those are going to be, right? Uh, it, it, but this last slide just goes to show you, sorry, I went, went a little farther than I, I should have there. Um, you know, the, the pre, do I save in pre-tax or after tax, Brandon? And that's the question that I get a lot. It's, it's the age old question. So, um, you know, what leaves you with more income? Uh, well, it sort of equals out right? Um, depending on what your, your rate of contribution is to your accounts and what tax rates end up being in the future. So I do want to leave a little bit of time for questions because I know some of you uh, has so thoughtfully submitted questions in advance um, and there, there may very well be, um, you know, the, uh, some, some further questions as well uh, as we've gone through this information. Um, but, you know, you can, you can like us on Facebook. If, uh, I'll just say this before we get to the questions. If, if this sort of information is stuff that uh, is very helpful to you, you want to engage more, you want to be in community, um, you know, I have a, a Facebook group. It's called the Money Mindset Community. You can join in on that. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn. Um, you can follow me on my business page on Facebook, Purpose Financial and Insurance Services. Um, you know, guys, Instagram, email, website in this digital age, um, there are just so many ways for you to engage. Um, you can text me, right? Uh, you want to text the chat, I'm, I'm good with that as well. Phone calls, I'm good on the old fashioned thing as well. Um, you can give me a call and um, for some reason, Sarah, I can't get, I can't, um, it won't allow me to advance back to the last. So you can, you can take control. I'm done with my, there we go. Um, so there's my email, Brandon at purposefis.com. Um, and you can text or call me. That's my direct cell there at 707-508-5980. Visit us at planyourlegacywithpurpose.com. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Sierra. She's got some, she's going to ask me some of the questions you guys served in advance and then she'll read the questions if any come through the text box. Yes, so we do have a couple that came through. Um, I am going to start though with the ones that came prior, which we do have some time for questions. So um, I think we're good on time here. So we'll jump in. Thank you um, for those of you who did send the questions in advance. That was awesome. Um, so the first question that we got was, um, I've lost a lot of money. I'm assuming this may be lately. 
Um, should I be removing my money? Should I be pulling it out? What should I be doing with it? Yeah, and uh, you know, that's, that's the number one question right now. Right. I don't care if you're my client or a friend or just any any of us. Right. We're all like, what do we what do we do in a time like this? Right. I've lost quite a bit of money. Uh, what do I do? Do I stay? Do I go? You know, um, so great question. If you ask that, if you submitted that question, thank you for submitting it. Uh, if you thought it and didn't submit it, <laughs> thank you for thinking it, um, because it's important. I, I want to touch on what I think is really important in that question is. I lost a lot of money. Um, so if you did submit that question, what do you mean by lost a lot of money, right? Because if, if we're talking about the account balance in our investment account has gone down because the market dropped, right? Yes, that's a truth. But you haven't technically actually lost any money in that unless you sell those investments, right? So you don't realize the loss unless you actually sell those investments. Now. Um, I am not going to answer that question, should you stay or should you go? Because I don't know anything about your personal circumstance, whoever, whoever submitted that question. Um, there is a whole lot of unpacking that needs to be done and a lot of discovery and conversation that needs to be had uh, before making any sort of advice on what you should do with your money at this point. Um, so if you did submit that question and you would like my humble professional opinion, um, or, you know, if, if being a client would be a benefit to you, um, you know, we would be happy to, to dig in and help you sort of come to resolution on the answer to that question. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the other important thing to, to note here in what's in between the lines of this question is we have to be very mindful of where we gather our information and how we gather it. Um, it would be, a, um, I would be doing an absolute disservice to anyone listening to say, well, you should exit the market right now, right? In, in any sort of like blanket way, financial advice is not applicable unless you're the person that's on with that radio host or that TV pundit asking a question about your particular financial situation. So I just, it's, uh, I want us to be really mindful of how we gather our financial advice, um, who we gather it from. Um, that's really, really important. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up that question's answer by saying, if you want an answer to that question, I, I am, I'm honored to serve and happy to help, um, but I need to know more. Okay, kind of a follow up to that one, I think is what's the safest financial option <laughs> to ride mm -hmm. out this period? Or if there's yeah. any advice you can give on that. Fantastic. Meet with your financial advisor. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Fantastic question. Um, you know, and, and again, I mean, there, there are lots of, of safe vehicles out there, but which one, you know, what, what kind of safety? Right, that's, that's the important point to, to think about in that question is what kind of safety are we talking about? Are we talking about short-term safety? Are we talking about long-term safety? Um, you know, though, because those are very different things. If I want short-term safety for my money, um, that's a very different uh, place to put it than if I want long-term safety for my money. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll say, Cash is always safe, right? And most times, right? Cash is a very safe place to be. But, um, you know, again, like going into cash might not, like liquidating your account and going into cash might not be the best option at this point. Like, so that takes more discovery. And, and you will, and you guys, uh, if this feels like I'm, I'm just uh, setting things off to the side, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not. I, 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 I try not to pass the buck, but I will say you'll, you will always hear me come back to, I need to know more, right? I need to know more about you and what your goals are and what your status in life is. Where is your position? Are you close to retirement? Are you 25 years old? Are you 40 years old? Um, all of those things have a huge bearing on what safety is and what steps we can take to ensure the safety of our money. But, um, if you don't have a financial advisor, guys, I, I am happy. I'm going to make myself available for questions and consult to everybody that is on this call. There is zero charge for that. There is zero expectation for that. There is zero obligation for that. But I am happy to support everybody and anybody that has questions here and needs guidance or 
wants to you know, ask questions in a specific way. So you have my contact information still on the screen, write it down, email me, connect with me on Facebook, do all those things. Um, and I'm happy to set time aside to answer individual specific questions in a more applicable way for you. Okay, I'm gonna take one, I think it kind of goes along with this, I'm gonna take one that came in. Um, it says the rate of return is a huge factor in determining the eventual accumulation, especially over a long period of time. Do you recommend running alternate rate of return scenarios for clients uh, when they are doing planning? I always run alternative rate of return illustrations. Always, always, always. Um, you know, one thing that I find is like a challenge, right, on, on the insurance side of things is like people will come to me with like these um, competing quotes or like competing illustrations from a different insurance company than what I've quoted or, or whatever. And they'll say, well, you know, see, here's, here's what they, they showed me, right? Here's what the rate of return and like, here's what it'll be out. And that's more than what you're illustrating. Um, oftentimes, guys uh, and gals, I'll tell you that, you know, illustrations are just illustrations. They're, they're hypotheticals, right? So I'm never going to come show you, well, here's the rate of return that you should expect, right? Uh, I'll give you a hypothetical alternatives, right? It might be 8%, might be 5%, it might be 2%, right? So I'll always give varying rates of return whenever I'm doing calculations like this. Um, you know, I, I start with a higher rate of return for that, um, for, for the EKG illustration. I do an 8% rate of return on that EKG illustration because generally speaking, if you take any 10 year period of time in the market, the average rate of return, even when, when you're factoring in, you know, uh, the, the pandemics, uh, market crashes, great depressions, right? World wars, all those things. Um, the worst 10 year period in the history of the New York Stock Exchange is 6.24%. So yeah, um, varying rates of return are a good idea because it helps us temper our expectations. It helps us understand, you know, this could go either way. It could be high, it could be low, it might be somewhere in between. So um, yes, is the answer to that question. I would always suggest that we run um, alternate rates of return when we're doing our planning for how, many, how big does that bag of money need to be? Okay, um, and then how can I protect assets in retirement? Mm. That sounds like somebody who's very near retirement. <laughs> <laughs> What's that one? Um, yeah, right. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say, right, there, there are different types of protection, right? Um, I think the best way to protect ourselves is to diversify our risk to diversify our asset classes, um, you know, and that, that's, that's just really, really important. We have to understand that there are different types of risk um, and those different types of risk come with different um, products or, or different investment types, right? So what we really just, and what my ultimate goal is always with any of my clients is to ensure that we have options when we're in retirement right? If this happens, then those, I mean, any good planner is going to help flesh out possible potential scenarios that could be catastrophic to our financial well-being, right? And, um, you know, how do I, when, when you say the, the words protect, right? Uh, I'll, I'll ask everybody sort of rhetorically because I know you're all muted and you can't answer. But when I say the word protect, what what product comes to mind? And I would guarantee that probably about 60 to 70% of you, if not more, just thought insurance, right? Because that's traditionally what we use to protect uh, things, right? Whether it's our assets, our homes, uh, you know, or, our, you know, our families, whatever the, the case might be, um, we use insurance in those ways, right? So using a good balance of insurance and investment um, to accumulate wealth and also then protect against or safeguard um, that accumulation, right? Not only along the way to retirement, but once we get into retirement, to have those assets and our financial well being and our families protected with uh, some if then kind of plans that we've already had in place for quite some time, right? Because 
insurance planning is best done early. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to plan like, you know, a, a lot of business owners and business leadership on, on the call today, right? We, we, we don't plan for a business succession when we're ready to, to leave the business. That's not the best case scenario, right? We put in a good five or 10 years of thought and pre-planned action to get out to that business succession point, right? When we're ready to sell the business, we already want to be ready to sell the business. So we've done that planning long in advance. So the, the best way to secure your assets in retirement is to put a, to put a good solid plan together far before retirement, a good, you know, want to start saving far before 10 years out from retirement. Right. But um, at least a good 10 years out, we start looking at, okay, now what, how do we, how do we position ourselves best to be in the best position possible when we're ready to start drawing on that money, right? So those are the strategies that I help my clients put in place and think through um, all the way because a lot of us have done good planning. Um, a lot of us have good advisors that have given us great advice, whether we've taken it or not. Um, <laughs> but for some reason, a lot of the time, we just don't take the action, right? Life gets busy. We uh, have this, that, or the other thing that's happening at work, or this thing got in the way, or now I'm not able to save, and uh, all kinds of reasons and, and um, purposes that come up in our life that we couldn't have planned for. Uh, what I help my clients do, and what I'm honored to be a part of doing, is helping people to think all the way through things and their own particular circumstance, goals, and needs, so that they can have the lifestyle that is best for them, not for anybody else, not for some idea, somebody else's idea of what retirement is, but for them, for you individually, what is best for you. That takes individual attention. That takes uh, individual discovery. So, um, you know, I, um, in two weeks, uh, I will be doing um, a workshop that um, will help us uh, really it's, it's another part of my um, my client process um, it, through a map illustration to understand where you are in your financial journey towards retirement finding the you are here spot on the map um, bringing all the things into one place so that you can understand exactly where you are and where your money is uh, and where your money is going uh, so that you can best chart for the place you want to be in retirement. Um, so I'll send out information. If you want to be a part of that, or that sounds interesting, again, it's digital, online, no expectation or obligation and no cost, but just informative and educational, um, then you know, uh, let Sierra know uh, or let me know, get in touch with me and I'll, I'll get you the information for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, his contact information is on the screen, but feel free if you already have mine, just go ahead and shoot it over and I'll forward it to Brandon. So. We can make it easy. Um, I do have one last question. We have a, just a few minutes. Um, but I do have one last question. I thought this one was kind of a fun one. What's your advice on penny stock trading and how to get started? <laughs> so maybe penny if, I don't know if you want to give a little back, like, you know, what yeah, penny stock uh, might be. Well, or by by penny to. stocks, they mean, you know, what are the stocks that are under a dollar, basically, okay. uh, stock shares that are under a dollar. Um, and, you know, there, guys and gals, there, there are a lot of platforms that um, one can execute that sort of uh, penny stock trading, buying and selling. Um, but I'll say before you even consider doing that, educate yourself, right? Go to websites like marketwatch.com, um, you know, to Seeking Alpha. Um, to, I mean, there, there are just so many, Motley Fool, there, there's so many websites that are out there to edu help you educate yourself on um, the best ways to, you know, trade stocks penny stocks or or otherwise um you know so my my advice to you on that is educate yourself i am not i'm not like a day trader i don't do a bunch of day trading buying and selling of stocks on a daily basis for my clients that's not the kind of advisor that i am i i, I know those guys and gals and happy to make referrals for people um if they want uh you know a stock trader um as a part of their team but, you know, in a general sense, I would just say educate yourself, go to those websites and, and start reading up uh, on what puts are, what calls are, what, uh, you know, uh, what all the different leading factors are that you need to know about stocks. Uh, and, uh, 
I'll say this, understand the risk that you're taking when you enter into those, you know, those kinds of, uh, those kind of accounts and, and strategies. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, this is Brandon's contact information. Um, I know in the previous slide, he also gave his phone number. So um, that might be a, a good starting point as well. Yeah. But um, again, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to connect you um, as well, if that's easier. So we just want to say thank you so much. Um, we're, yeah, we're definitely getting close to time. So thank you so much, Brandon. Um, we just want to really just express our gratitude for you taking your time out today and preparing this information for everybody. So thank you. Um, and thank pleasure. you everybody for joining us. We're really happy that um, you were here today. We look forward to our next webinar coming up. Um, again, save the date. It's uh, Tuesday, June 2nd. Um, and we'll be sharing more information on um, other upcoming webinars. We have a few that are in the works as well, and they're all going to be coming up on starhr.com slash webinars. So just kind of keep checking back. And of course, you'll, you'll be getting um, my emails as well about when you can register for those. So we hope that you will join us. Um, and that's all we have for you today. So thank you so much. And we will talk soon. Thank you, Brandon. Um, thank have you. a great day, everyone. Thanks, guys and gals.